everybody and welcome to our lecture for this week's set topic, which is trans aesthetics. So I've got, as usual, two short lectures for you. I'm just going to share my screen and find my lecture slides and slideshow. Oops, my computer's being a bit slow. Play from the start. Here we go. OK, hope you can see that. <clears throat> so this week, then, we're thinking about the Netflix TV series Sensate, which um, ran from 2015 to 2018. And we're thinking about it particularly as a trans produced mainstream media production brought to screen by Lana and Lily Wachowski. And I want to think in these lectures about what trans aesthetics might mean in terms of the show's formal properties, its queering of the human via technological and ecological post-humanisms, its use of genre, and also its depiction of transgender life. So this show follows a series of linked protagonists who live in different parts around the world, um, Mexico City, London, San Francisco, Nairobi, Seoul, Mumbai, Berlin and Chicago. And it brings into a kind of <clears throat> glossy big budget visualization, the utopian dream of disembodied mind to mind communication. And this is something that early users of the Internet anticipated. So we have in the show then a kind of avatarial virtual travel where the viewer um, experiences things alongside the protagonists as though they were an avatar, maybe in a games, uh, in a computer game. And it's been described as like FaceTime, but without actually the technology of a phone, just immediate mind to mind connection. And this is a kind of literalization of our contemporary globalized um, dispersed community. And it's specifically grounded in a trans experience and um, uh, also queer identities as well. So I've set two episodes for our viewing this week. The first is the opening episode of season one, which is called Limbic Resonance. And the second episode, um, also in the first season, uh, comes along towards the end of that season and is episode 10. So what I'm going to do in this first lecture is give you a little bit of background and introduction to Sense8. But then I'm going to focus on um, trans studies and particular approaches that might help us work through what is it we mean when we say trans aesthetics and how can a show like Sensate privilege a particular kind of trans um, experience. So Sensate then is a high concept um, drama, if you like, from the Wachowskis and is arguably their best work since um, The Matrix. The show is a kind of high minded science fiction that both has emotional impact, but also is action packed as well. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's gathered such a loyal fan base. <clears throat> um, but also the show was extremely costly to produce and it apparently came by the, by by the time of season two, it was coming close to nine million dollars per episode. And that's what led to it being cancelled, although the Wachowskis were allowed a sort of grand finale to try and finish off a show, which I guess they had previously anticipated would be much longer than just two seasons. OK, so um, in terms of thinking about um, the relationship between the um, director producers and the text itself, this show is the work of Lana and Lily Wachowski, um, a very well-known creative pairing um, siblings who are widely considered to be Hollywood auteurs. That is directors whose aesthetic is distinctive enough that they can achieve the status of a literary author enacting their own unique stylistic vision, rather than more commonly, uh, we would consider directors to just be leading um, a creative team of professionals in a sort of collaborative production. They rose to fame with their sci-fi box office hit um, the Matrix in 1999, which had several subsequent iterations that I'm sure you'd be familiar with. 
They then um, produced the uh, comics action adaptation V for Vendetta in 2005, followed in 2012 by a really ambitious adaptation of David Mitchell's best-selling novel Cloud Atlas, um, and subsequently an epic space opera from 2015 called Jupiter Ascending. And so the Wachowskis are a really interesting um, kind of pairing, creative pairing to look at. They've built up an, an immense fan base um, and a lot of energetic praise and really loyal fandom for their work, but they've also been condemned for various things. Um, their combination of popular science fiction world building and complex narratives have even prompted the scholar, the media scholar Henry Jenkins, to coin the term transmedia storytelling which he uses to describe um, the sort of paratextual world, the world beyond the text itself of official books, um, of comics, information, merch, um, you know, sort of fan participation and so on that we saw with the Matrix franchise. Um, and this has been followed through in Sense8 as well. So the Matrix itself was really influential and the fact that it led directly to this idea of transmedia storytelling, which has been applied to many other works, um, gives you some sense of how important the Wachowski's work is within Hollywood. But they are also transgender auteurs working in the Hollywood system. Um, and although critics would note that the, the kind of Wachowski brand, if you like, has been built on the currency of cisgender male privilege within the film industry since the mainstream success of The Matrix um, onwards. When she first came out as transgender in 2012, Lana Wachowski was the first director um, to do so at, at that level at, of kind of Hollywood stardom. And she became a very powerful and visible ally of the trans community. Um, she was followed by her sister Lily, who then came out a few years later in 2017. And I've just got a quote for you here from um, Lily Wachowski, which I thought would be interesting for us to think about. So she says, to be transgender is something largely understood as existing within the dogmatic terminus of male or female. And to transition imparts a sense of immediacy a before and after from one terminus to another. But the reality, my reality, is that I've been transitioning and will continue to transition all my life through the infinite that exists between male and female, as it does in the infinite between the binary of zero and one. <clears throat> we need to elevate the dialogue beyond the simplicity of binary. Binary is a false idol, end quote. So I guess my starting point in thinking about the show is to ask, does it matter that these author directors of Sense8, of a show which prominently explores trans and queer identities, are themselves trans women? Is their experience even necessary to exploring a variety of gender identities in a, in a TV serial format? And the answers to these questions, as we're going to see, are pretty complex. And the discourse around transsexual and transgender subjectivities is also extremely fractious. And you may be aware of, um, of recent <laughs> discussions in uh, broadcast media and elsewhere of the ongoing arguments among and around trans communities. Um, so I want to be quite precise, um, sort of quick caveat, the way that I'm going to approach this is very much through looking at trans activists and historians themselves and what they write about their own experience and specifically focusing on um, the kind of techniques and methods that they might be able to suggest that we could use in, in fleshing out what trans aesthetics means. It's not a term that is widely used. In some senses, I'm helping create and shape this term, but I think it works quite well for um, our purposes in exploring Sensate. So where do we start? Well, I think perhaps our starting point should be Sandy Stone's influential 1987 essay, The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto, which she first presented in 1988 at an academic conference in California. It was written in response to Janice Raymond's 1979 book, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the She-Male 
I'm not going to go into Janice Raymond and I don't have time to, but um, you could look her up if you're interested. Um, and it's a great source of controversy, that book, and has been widely accused of being transphobic, although um, Janice Raymond herself defends her work. Um, so there's a whole kind of controversy you can look up there if you're interested. And Sandy Stone then, in response to that book, outlines um, uh, in her essay a kind of medicalized history of transsexualism, as it was called at the time, which was only actually accorded the status of an official disorder in 1980. So it's really very recent. And that was the first time that it was listed in the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So describing a very uneasy relationship between um, the academic gender dysphoria clinics that were starting to emerge at places like Stanford and elsewhere from the 1960s to try and treat gender dysphoria amongst transsexuals and the trans community itself, Sandy Stone writes, and I quote here, concomitant with the dubious achievement of a diagnostic category is the inevitable blurring of boundaries as a vast heteroglossic account of difference, heretofore invisible to the legitimate professions, suddenly achieves canonization and simultaneously becomes homogenized to satisfy the constraints of the category. Suddenly the old morality tale of the truth of gender told by a kindly white patriarch in New York in 1966. And here she's referring to Harry Benjamin's definitive medical textbook, uh, The Transsexual Phenomenon, um, becomes pan-cultural in the 1980s. Emergent polyvocalities of lived experience, never represented in the discourse, but present at least in potential, disappear. Um, and then she goes on to say, I wish to point out the broad similarities which this peculiar juxtaposition suggests to aspects of colonial discourse with which we may be familiar. The initial fascination with the exotic extending to professional investigators, denial of subjectivity and lack of access to the dominant discourse followed by a species of rehabilitation. Okay, <clears throat> so out of this essay, I think two things are particularly relevant for our consideration of trans aesthetics. The first is this description of um, a vast heteroglossic account of difference and the, I love this phrase, the emergent polyvocalities of lived experience. And by this Stone then is indicating the richness and almost infinite variety of trans lives that have been straitjacketed into a medicalized condition which had highly prescriptive boundaries and rules. So she talks in very interesting ways about particular case studies in the medical record, um, which give us a sense of the kind of performance that transsexuals had to undergo if they were to be allowed surgery. So to become eligible, they had to perform their trans identity in a particular kind of way that conformed to a very limited set of medical textbooks, including this idea of um, being in the wrong body that Harry Benjamin outlines in the transsexual phenomenon. So I guess um, this then leads us to ask, how might a trans aesthetics within a text like Sensate actually signal these polyvocalities of lived experience that are emergent, they're not yet fully formed or crystallized, they're only just beginning in potentia to appear? And what kind of formal aesthetic strategies might we employ in trying to uncover that heterogeneity of trans experience, not just as it currently is, in whichever period or moment we're analysing the text, but as it might be in the future, in the future, sorry. So that's the first thing I think is important for our purposes. And the second thing is the role of the trans auteur as somebody who speaks and who has been denied subjectivity, as Stone puts it, and has been denied access to the dominant medical and psychiatric discourse about their own life and their own condition. As she writes, to attempt to occupy a place as a speaking subject within the traditional gender frame is actually to become complicit in the discourse that one wishes to deconstruct. So it's an almost impossible double bind that in trying to insert themselves into that dominant discourse, the trans 
creative artist, practitioner, auteur has to kind of become part of that traditional gender frame. Um, okay, so that's that's a starting point to give us some ideas for how we might proceed with our analysis. Um, a second point then would refer back to the work of um, Susan Stryker, and I'll say a bit more about her in a moment, but she's been really important um, as a kind of archivist, community historian and um, theorist of, tr of transgender identity, history and, and so on. Uh, and she has a, a more recent book called Transgender History, which goes back uh, several decades and uncovers materials kept at the archive where she worked for a while. Um, and she writes, because transgender is a word that came into widespread use only in the past couple of decades, its meanings are still under construction. So there's still a kind of fluid gelatinous sense of, of what these terms might mean and what they could mean in the future. And one way of approaching this discursive signifier of um, transgender might then to be via um, Susan Stryker to look back at Sandy Stone in the post-transsexual manifesto and think about something Sandy Stone says, which is really interesting, that she doesn't want trans to be considered a problematic third gender beyond male and female, but rather she wants us to try and think about trans as a genre, a whole new genre of an almost infinite number of possible um, gendered and non-gendered and non-binary and binary experiences. That, that heterogeneity that she says has been lacking from the discourse. And as she writes, a genre is a set of embodied texts whose potential for productive disruption of structured sexualities and spectra of desire has yet to be explored, end quote. So I'm wondering whether we might read Sensate as pointing towards the trans aesthetics of a new genre of texts that explore trans lives, um, as one critic puts it, that make explicit their rejection of the here and now marked by transphobia, sexism, racism, and globalized capitalism, and gives us image and sound to a queer future that might not yet be present, but is for some nonetheless palpable on the horizon. <clears throat> okay, so just a few more things to say about transgender studies as a disciplinary, um, sort of field, if you like. Although it was coined in the 1980s, the term transgender actually only took on its contemporary meaning in 1992, after Leslie Feinberg used it in a small pamphlet titled Transgender Liberation. Um, and Leslie Feinberg attributes the term transgender to Virginia Prince, who advocated for freedom of gender expression. So we've got different terms here, and Susan Stryker is, is very helpful. I've given you here a quote from her introduction to the Transgender Studies Reader, which came out in 2006, um, to help us work through the terms in as kind of precise and correct a way as we can, although with the caveat that these are fluid terms that continue to develop. Um, so she says, if a transvestite was somebody who episodically changed into the clothes of the so-called other sex, and if a transsexual was somebody who permanently changed their genitals in order to claim membership in a gender other than that that they were assigned at birth, then the transgender person is someone who permanently changes their social gender through public presentation of self. Uh, without recourse necessarily to surgery or genital transformation. So ideas of public presentation, of the performative nature of subjectivity, which um, derives in, in large part from Judith Butler's work on gender theory, is important here. As a category, writes the uh, academic Katerina Nieta, Transgender has the power to cross binary understandings of male and female and to retain by definition a disruptive force which questions and challenges the very notion of gender as we know it. Okay, so coming back to Susan Stryker then, herself a trans woman, a community-based historian living in San Francisco, which is one of the locations in Sense8 and is famous for its genderqueer community and activism. 
Um, so she notes that transgender emerged as a kind of buzzword in the early 1990s um, and became the term of choice in a variety of different popular and specialist discourses for a lot of different phenomena, which call attention to the fact that gender, as it is lived, as it is embodied physically in our bodies, as it is felt and experienced affectively, as it is performed or presented in a self-conscious way, and as it is encountered in the way in which other people um, uh, may interpolate our own subject position. She says that this, this idea of gender is much more complex and varied than can be accounted for simply by the dominant binary of sex and gender, which has dominated um, the ideology of European modernity. Uh, and so this brings us to the long quote that I've got here on the screen. Transgender studies, she writes, is the academic field that claims as its purview transsexuality and cross-dressing, some aspects of intersexuality and homosexuality, cross-cultural and historical investigations of human gender diversity, myriad specific subcultural expressions of gender atypicality, theories of sexed embodiment and subjective gender identity development, law and public policy related to the regulation of gender expression, and many other similar issues. It is an interdisciplinary field that draws on the social sciences and psychology, the physical and life sciences, and the humanities and arts. It is um, as concerned with material conditions as it is with representational practices and often plays particularly close attention to the interface between these two. So most broadly conceived, the field of transgender studies is concerned with anything that disrupts, denaturalizes, re-articulates and makes visible the normative linkages we generally assume to exist between the biological specificity of the sexually differentiated human body the social roles and statuses uh, that a particular kind of body is expected to occupy, the subjectively experienced relationship between a gendered sense of self and social expectations of gender role performance, and the cultural mechanisms that work to sustain or thwart specific configurations of gendered personhood. That's a really long sentence, <laughs> quite hard to read, but I think that's an incredibly helpful um, and sort of rich um, starting point to think about transgender studies and the sort of um, variety of, uh, of gendered personhood and its configurations, as she puts it. Okay, so that's some sense of, of what transgender studies has become since the 1980s and 1990s. So we are talking about a pretty young field in academic terms. But what then might trans aesthetics be? <clears throat> Going back to Susan Stryker, who wrote, um, uh, oh, sorry, continuing, I should say, with Susan Stryker, um, a little bit earlier though, uh, an earlier piece that she wrote called My Words to Victor Frankenstein Above the Village of Chamonix. So this was um, a performance piece um, that she delivered uh, and then was subsequently turned into an academic essay and has become uh, a really important um, uh, reference point for trans studies. Um, and she said of the piece that her idea was to actually perform this self-consciously queer gender rather than just talking about it in, in academic discourse. She wanted to actually embody and enact it. Um, simultaneously within the discussion. She wanted the formal structure of the work to express what she called a transgender aesthetic by replicating our abrupt, often jarring transitions between genders, which challenge generic classification with the form of my words, as she writes, just as my transsexuality challenges the conventions of legitimate gender and my performance in the conference room challenged the boundaries of acceptable academic discourse. So this um, performative piece then, a kind of monologue, began as follows, and here's the quote for you. The transsexual body is an unnatural body. It is the product of medical science. It is a technological construction. It is flesh torn apart and sewn together again 
in a shape other than that in which it was born. In these circumstances, I find a deep affinity between myself as a transsexual woman and the monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Like the monster, I am too often perceived as less than fully human due to the means of my embodiment. Like the monsters as well, my exclusion from, humi from human community fuels a deep and abiding rage in me that I, like the monster, direct against the conditions in which I must struggle to exist." End quote. I think this is a really clear moment of connection with our earlier um, topic of xenofeminism, talking about post-human embodiment of a kind of uh, trans-inclusive feminist pol revolutionary politics, um, and particularly drawing on ideas of um, Donna Haraway's um, Cyborg, which itself quotes Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as thinking about these assemblages of human bodies in conjunction with the technological, the medical, or even um, you know, the post-human, and in fact, the ecological, as I'm gonna come on to in a moment. So for Susan Straker then, um, transsexuality uh, represents this possibility to destabilize ideas about fixed gender um, around which personal identity politics has been formed. And for that reason, they provoke such a severe reaction, she says, particularly um, in terms of right wing uh, white supremacist, um, Christian kind of backlash against the trans community in America where she lives and works. Um, but also elsewhere, um, the, the, it's one thing to, to move from one gender to another, but that presupposes that the gender binary is, is maintained, that that kind of cultural um, disciplined fiction remains, but to just abolish the gender boundary altogether. Um, and to open up a, a whole spectrum of possible desires and affects and experiences, it is a very revolutionary thing to do in those terms. Um, and I think that's why Sensei is such an interesting show. I think there's also a connection here when we looked at um, last week's material on Claudia Rankine and thinking about anti-Black racism. Rankine talks in her work about the violence of words, of discourse and language, and I think this violence is present here too when we're talking about trans identity and trans aesthetics and representation. As Susan Stryker herself puts it, words like creature, monster and unnatural need to be reclaimed by the transgendered. By embracing and accepting them or even piling them one on top of the other, we might dispel their ability to harm us." End quote. Okay, so those were the sort of performative trans aesthetics of Susan Stryker's um, academic performance, My Words to Victor Frankenstein. But what, where else might we turn to think about trans aesthetics and what kinds of methods and methodologies are being developed in contemporary critical theory in film and media studies that could help us understand trans aesthetics? So I've picked out three for our discussion um, this evening. And I'm just going to summarize them briefly here and then I'll take you through them one by one. So the first then is um, uh, a text by Eliza Steinbrock, who has written about the cinematic philosophy of transgender embodiment in a work called Shimmering Images, Trans Cinema Embodiment and the Aesthetics of Change, which came out in 2019. And this approach foregrounds the formal properties of cinema focusing on the disjunctive um, properties that um, narrative film has between frames, the jumping between the visual and the spoken, the transition between different film genres, and helps us to think about cinema's suitability as a medium for this idea of transitioning and, um, and transformation. Uh, and so, um, as Steinbrock notes, then this can help us perhaps think about transgender experience and transgender embodiment. Um, the second is also developed mainly in cinema, but also some TV texts are mentioned, including Sensate, is an idea of um, trans literacy as a method. Uh, and this has been developed by um, Acadia Ford in a book called Trans New Wave Cinema, which came out this year in 2021. 
and transliter transliteracy sorry, situates um, films that privilege or depict trans identities and trans issues on screen within the context of their production. So these are films that are seen as grounded in queer and trans communities. They are understood as independent countercultural sites of community. So the, the, the new wave films that she looks at are outside of and beyond sort of mainstream Hollywood um, production. So that's transliteracy. And then the third approach that I want to consider is trans utopianism. And this comes from Katerina Nurter, who wrote a book back in, I think it was 2017, called Marginal Bodies, Trans Utopias. Um, and she draws on um, ideas of queer temporality and queer futurity, um, particularly in the work of Jose Esteban Munoz, and also the process philosophy of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, French post-structuralist, post-foundationalist philosophers, who I think we've mentioned before in passing. Uh, and she writes then about transgender subjectivities as exemplary of this idea of philosophical becoming, a particular subjective um, experience, a sort of ontology that is never settled, never fixed, never arrives, is always continually in the process of transforming and becoming. And so in this way, uh, she argues that trans um, experience can help us to move beyond reductive views of the subject, which have tended to be fixed and can help us to deconstruct the gender binary. So her work is particularly interesting because it's beyond film studies. It's more of a kind of philosophical, sociological, political text. Um, and she's arguing that actually trans um, identities and experiences have something really important for all of us to think about when it comes to subjectivity and subject positions. So those are the three approaches just very briefly summarized. I'll just talk you through in a little bit more detail to try and help us think about the, the aesthetic properties um, that we might explore. Okay, so starting then with Eliza Steinbrock in her 2019 book, Shimmering Images, Trans Cinema Embodiment and the Aesthetics of Change. She writes that culturally, trans has a privileged relationship to an aesthetics of change. Writing about trans cinema, Steinbrock argues that cinematic cuts and sutures between the visual and the spoken, between frames and between genres are delinking and relinking practices of transfiguration. So the idea then is that the medium of narrative construction within cinematic storytelling requires viewers to make connections uh, kind of across and between different kinds of cuts um, as they have um, developed into a kind of recognizable vocabulary of, of cinematic narrative. We have things like jump cuts, match cuts, transitions from one scene to another. And these have accreted over time since narrative cinema really began as many film historians would argue with the 1903 film, The Great Train Robbery, which you can see here which is um, described as being the first narrative movie, the first um, piece of work at the cinema that actually told a story. Um, and the, um, the innovative uh, narrative techniques that were used in The Great Train Robbery were then developed by um, the film author D.W. Griffith, um, who similarly kind of linked shots through editing techniques that we still use to this day. So we're thinking here about long shots and close-ups, how they are used to combine into a single dramatic scene to give different ideas of perspective, how parallel editing can help us jump from one story to another within the film and, and make the viewers aware that these two things are happening simultaneously through the use of cross-cutting and intercutting. Um, quick side note, although D.W. Griffith is generally held to be incredibly important here as a pioneer of narrative cinema, he's also a white supremacist and many film historians that I know would not teach his work um, at a university because of the way he features things like the Ku Klux Klan. So important side note, but he, he does tend to get cited in terms of narrative cinema. Um, okay, so um, coming back to Eliza Steinbrook then, 
I think what she's asking us to do in this idea of aesthetics of change is to kind of go back to the earliest foundations of cinematic history and bear in mind that what we see as a continuous verbal and visual narrative is in fact, when you take apart and deconstruct its constituent um, ingredients, a series of disjunctive shots, perspectives, um, performances by actors and also different genres that often tend to get combined into a story. And this disjunctive quality is inherent to cinema. As a discrete aesthetic form, she writes, cinema presents a golden opportunity for staging disjunction, for experimenting with how bodies and images are seen and articulated, often in startling ways. And in this way, cinephilia models an intensified mode of trans loving and trans becoming. Trans becoming, very similar term to Katerina Nieta's idea of becoming trans, as I'll come back to in a moment. Okay, so this gives us our first approach to thinking about trans aesthetics, helping us to focus on the formal properties of cinematic storytelling. <clears throat> and although Sensei isn't actually a film, it's a TV series, it can arguably be, arguably be considered an extension of the Wachowski's established cinematic output. So scholars will often talk about this. Um, and it's certainly an example of what has been called by Jason Mittell, quality, quality TV, which is referred to as sort of novelistic, things like The Wire, The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, and so on. Um, and Jason Mattel uh, defends these TV shows as being worthy um, of uh, a sort of penetrating formal analysis on their own medium terms, just as much as art cinema or, you know, the great 19th century realist novels, for example. So although it's, it's within cinema studies, it definitely is applicable to a TV show like Sensei. Okay, so moving to our second approach, which is this idea of trans literacy. And this comes from Acadia Ford's 2021 book, Trans New Wave Cinema. So as Ford argues, the method of trans literacy situates depictions of trans identities and issues on screen, both film, but also a little bit of TV, within the context of their production which is seen as grounded in queer and trans communities. And these are understood as countercultural sites of trans community. So I think this is important because it returns us to the earlier point about the Wachowski sisters and their own experience as trans women, as trans auteurs um, in the creation and production of Sensei, the fact that they wanted to make this show and they wanted to make it in a particular, quite formally um, disjunctive and experimental way. So how do we approach the text through a transliteracy idea of situating it within its kind of broader community? So uh, I've given you a quote here from Ford who defines transliteracy as a theoretical approach to translating narratives and imagery in transgender films to a wider audience embedded within understandings of trans issues, gender and sexualities within the communities producing the films. That is, helping us to become transliterate as film and TV viewers and encouraging the wider community of filmmakers, writers, writers, activists and researchers to ensure that the lived experience of trans lives and communities inform the cinematic representations and the discussions of the screen texts themselves. So this is all about trying to find a particular kind of authenticity. If we're going to represent trans issues, we shouldn't refer to um, cliches or stereotypes, and we should be um, going, you know, seeking out these stories within the trans community itself. Where are the trans writers, the trans filmmakers, the trans actors and performers? And the trans and trans literacy is intended to encompass a community of gender diverse people fostered at community based queer and trans film festivals in particular, that is for Acadia Ford. Uh, and she thinks that these vibrant and messy interactions and engagements between fans, spectators, practitioners and so on can help film and TV audiences to connect um, with films that feature these trans issues and to connect the films with the independent countercultural sites of trans community. So beyond Hollywood, for example, as a dominant cinematic site of official cultural gatekeeping, 
how do we find new material in transgender film festivals? Um, and what kinds of trans identities are being represented there? <clears throat> If we're going to take a trans literacy approach to thinking about sensei, we can't get beyond the fact that it is a mainstream Hollywood production, along with other online streaming series. So you might include here Transparent from 2014 to 2019, and also Orange is the New Black from 2013 to 2019, and also films such as Tangerine from 2015. This new generation of trans focused mainstream texts that are targeted at millennial audiences have increased media attention within the mainstream film industry on trans issues and trans actors and directors. So the showrunner and director of Transparent, for, ex for example, who um, used to be known as Jill Soloway and is now Joey Soloway, launched a transformative action program to um, that led to the employment of more than 80 transgender people um, on the show. So that's one example of how um, a TV show attempted to bring in the trans community um, and to actually have a kind of almost like a quota, a program of affirmative action to make sure that they were hired in the cast and the crew. Um, but that attempt, as laudable as it may be, has also been slightly hampered by the fact that two of the crew have accused the star Jeffrey Tambor of sexual harassment. So there were, if you look that example up, you'll find that being discussed in, um, you know, the journalistic press. Um, okay, so what does it matter then to have you know, trans actors being featured in these shows. What is the cultural significance of trans in our contemporary moment? Or um, to put it another way, what is the cultural significance of trans issues and identities moving from those independent sites of countercultural production that Arcadia Ford talks about in the trans new wave and over into the big budget, the mainstream film and TV on streaming platforms like Amazon and Netflix, or into uh, Hollywood cinema itself. So she attempts to give us an answer, and I've given you the quote here, and she says, for wider audiences, and specifically for trans people, trans women and trans women of colour who have experienced an absence of empowered screen portrayals, Seeing Juliana Huxtable in a Spike Lee series, she's got to have it, and that's um, who is featured here in this image, is a loud affirmation of being in the community, projecting support, acceptance, and cultural arrival. These contemporary exemplar trans actresses within the gender diverse communities have proudly represented trans women and the wider trans community, both on and off screen. So this brings us to Sensei. Not only is it made and directed by two trans women, but it also features a trans actress in the character of um, Nomi, who's pictured here on the right hand side. The storyline uh, centred around Nomi Marx, as one critic puts it, is a rare and important depiction of a trans woman in a lesbian relationship being cared for, desired, having sexual autonomy. And the character of Nomi Marx has broken new ground, I guess, in terms of this uh, idea of transformative action. Played by the trans actress Jamie Clayton, Nomi is depicted in what critics suggest is the world's first on-screen intersectional trans lesbian relationship with her girlfriend Amanita, uh, known as Neats, seen here on the left hand side. As Ford says, what these depictions highlight is how a screen character voiced through the embodiment of a trans actress or a trans actor has the opportunity to authentically express trans lives for audiences in ways that avoid stereotypes and tropes, given a supportive writer, director and producer. Each time a trans actor steps on screen in a trans role, the performance exceeds what cisgender actors have available to bring to trans character roles. This is because when a cisgender actor plays a transgender character, this demands a double performance. Performing a gender in the way that Judith Butler defines gender performativity 
and also performing a character, which then leads to um, if, if, the, if a cisgender actor is trying to play a transgender character, they may end up um, falling back on recognisable and stylized gender gestures, if you like, um, which can lead us back into the realm of stereotype and a lack of authenticity. So this is why she says it's so important that trans actors and actresses need to be playing trans characters to give us that authenticity. Okay, so let's turn then to the third approach, um, which is this idea of trans utopianism from Katerina Nieta's book, Marginal Bodies, Trans Utopias. Okay, so I'll just give you a little quote then um, from the introduction. As Nieta writes, the challenges posed by gender today are very different to those of 20 years ago. The transgender body has emerged as a site of contradictions that embodies the idea of futurity. Futurity here is intended as a motion of becoming and of possibilities, almost an impulse, never an ideology. An affirmative movement capable of destabilizing assemblage made of provocation and difference. Futurity contains within itself the seed for producing a vision that stretches out of the recognized limits of spaces and bodies. Ethical utopian spaces not only entail the inclusion of what is real and tangible, but must also account for what is possible, because what is possible not only is real, but is also in the now. Okay, so there's quite a lot going on here. Um, uh, I guess the first thing to say is that Katerina Nieta's work is to some extent indebted to the influential Cuban American performance studies professor Jose Esteban Munoz, who died in 2013. Um, but published uh, a really important work called Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity. So I'll just say a little bit about this work to be able to come back to Katerina Nieta's um, relocation of this idea within trans utopianism. So Munoz's work was very important in bringing utopian philosophy into contact with queer theory, and it offers a powerful rejoinder to um, a, 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 itself a very influential book, but also quite a nihilistic account, which was Lee Edelman's 2004 book, No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive. Uh, and in that book, just to summarise very, very briefly and probably not to do it much justice, um, Edelman suggests that queer subjects don't have a future because futurity and our normative social construction of the idea of the future is completely bound up in ideas of children and the next generation. So in politics, he says, you'll often hear politicians say, you know, we need to think about the children when we're talking about X or Y. And so it becomes impossible to imagine any future collectively that doesn't involve children. And for those reasons, queer couples are excluded from the future. And so in a sort of affirmative but also nihilistic way they need to find their own kind of experience and temporality um, and it's been very influential and lots of scholars have sort of argued with and against Lee Edelman um, but where Edelman suggests that queer subjects don't have a future Munoz insists instead that queerness is not yet here that queerness is the future but we haven't yet found it we haven't yet managed to reach it so let's have a little look at this because it's quite a complicated um, kind of idea of temporality. As he writes then, queerness is an ideality. Put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. We have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality that can be distilled from the past and used to imagine a future. The future is queerness's domain. Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. The here and now is a prison house. We must strive in the face of the here and now's totalizing rendering of reality to think and feel a then and a there. Some will say that all we have are the pleasures of this moment, but we must never settle for that minimal transport. We must dream and enact new and better pleasures, other ways of being in the world, 
and ultimately new worlds. Queerness is a longing that propels us onward. Queerness is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough, that indeed something is missing. Something is missing is a quote from the German philosopher Ernst Bloch, who himself quoted a line that recurred throughout Goethe's work. Something is missing, the fair moment is yet to come. And so this is, um, this is a utopian argument which suggests that we need to create better worlds. Um, we need to create better dreams, better pleasures, better ways of being um, with one another. That queer longing propels us forwards towards um, a more inclusive future, a more egalitarian future outside the quagmire of the present and the prison house of the here and now. He describes it as a horizon imbued with potentiality whose warm illumination we feel but that we cannot yet touch, we can never quite touch or experience as an ideal. I think this idea of queerness as being not yet here is very powerful. Um, and it, it gives a whole, a whole new complexion to ideas of queer desire and queer experience that is positive, um, that insists that not only do queer people have a place in the future, but that all of us have a place within a queer future and that queering the future would enact um, a powerful, um, radical liberatory moment for everybody, whether they're queer or not. And I think that's the spirit in which Katerina Nurta is writing about trans utopianism. And so she takes this idea of queering the longing that propels us forward from Munoz, and she applies it to her own analysis of trans identity. Okay, so as the media scholar Rafi Sarkissian writes, um, and I quote, while today's binge watch culture values completion and conflict resolution as accomplishment, Sense8 settles for discovery, process and patience instead. This is precisely why Sense8 should be read as a trans narrative, in addition to being a transgender authored project. Oops, sorry, that seems to be the end of my slideshow. <laughs> Hold on, I'll stop sharing. Okay, so just to finish up then, um, I think this idea of trans utopianism is particularly helpful. It allows us to consider the ways in which transgender, transsexuality and gender variant subjectivities open up a world of possibility. Um, what Susan Stryker earlier referred to as the emergent polyvocalities of lived experience. Um, and this world of um, possibility exists beyond the gender boundary, the, gen the gender binary, sorry. Katerina Nieta's approach to trans utopianism, um, which draws itself, as I mentioned, on Deleuze's ontology of difference, which is something that um, issues essentialisms and tries to enact um, a philosophical method of continual process and becoming can help us then to apprehend individuals who identify beyond the gender binary in, and help them write their own narrative by appropriating their subjectivity and creating a space wherein to signify for what they are, as she says, rather than for what the female and male normative binary has imagined for them. Okay, so hopefully that's a few um, conceptual frameworks that we can use in developing our idea of trans aesthetics. Um, I'm going to stop recording now and if you pop over to part two of the lecture I'm going to look in a little bit more detail at um, specific scenes from Sensate. Brilliant, thank you very much.